This series, which is taking place over the course of this year, it examines the obstacles that are faced by hardworking people in our region whose earnings can't match the cost of, of living. A group of United Ways in our state recently released a comprehensive report that reveals why so many Marylanders can't get ahead. It's called the Alice Report. Let me begin by defining Alice for you. Alice stands for Asset Limited Income Constrained Employed. If there's an upside to this pandemic, it's the fact that it's a shining, a spotlight on workers who are essential to our economy. I'm talking about our healthcare workers, first responders, grocery store and delivery service employees, and so many more. These are all people who are essential to maintaining infrastructures and operations that allow us to really navigate all the way through our lives with ease, but they can't afford the essentials like housing, food, healthcare, childcare, transportation, smartphone, et cetera. So the Alice Report, it helps us to better understand the obstacles that they face and why. So I'd like to offer our sincere thanks to Kaiser Permanente, our very generous corporate partner in the Maryland Alice Report, and all of our other partners for their support. Thank you so very much. We use this report to inform our decision-making around our programs and we share it freely with others, including nonprofits and other organizations to really help guide and aid them in their work. And so now this is unsettling news from the report. A staggering 39% of Maryland households can't make ends meet. That's two out of every five households in the state. These are people, and you may know at least one of them, perhaps even more, who struggle every single day to pay their bills, to keep a roof over their head, to put food on their table, and to keep their family safe and healthy. Why is the question, right? We all wanna know why, because the cost of living, it outpaces what they really earn every single day. For example, a family of four, two adults with two children in school, they need to earn $77,000 a year just to make ends meet in Baltimore County, for example. Rising housing costs are a serious challenge for Alice households. In Baltimore County, a two bedroom apartment is about $1,700 a month. When you consider that most of these people are working at minimum wage jobs, which at full time only pays a little over $22,000 a year, or about $1,800 a month before taxes, it's obvious why they can't get ahead, even if both parents are working hard. So now more than ever, action is sorely needed to assure the health and well-being of far too many in individuals and far too many families in our region who are juggling their bills, trying to stay ahead and making decisions about what to pay to get through that week or that month, often with precarious results. And so United Way has long worked with people in the Alice population. And since the pandemic, we've stepped up to meet their growing need and the needs of those who have suddenly become part of this group. We're in this for the long haul, folks. We always have been and always will continue to be. We've been helping people in this region for 95 years, especially during times of crisis. And so now we're going to hear from a dynamic group of people about the housing crisis that's existed for a long time here in Greater Baltimore. And that's now compounded, as we all know, as eviction moratoriums that are established when they begin to become lifted in the region, it will only be exacerbated. And so I'd like to introduce you to Dr. Scott Gopreth, who's the Associate Vice President of Homeless Services for United Way of Central Maryland, who will moderate today's session. Scott, take it away. Thank you, Franklin. Let's jump right in. Uh, we are in the midst of a crisis, a global financial crisis that was caused by COVID. When the government shutdown happened, businesses shuttered, and millions of folks lost their jobs. In the United States, 14 million people became unemployed in, the, in March and April, and the economy reached a peak of 16% unemployment in May, which is worse than the highest peak of the Great Recession. One third of all workers in the United States were impacted by this financial crisis, either in the form of reduced hours or layoffs. And that's not to mention the informal economy or all the belt tightening that families had to do. 
Um, our 211 system, many of you know, is what we call the first call for help. I like to call it social services 911. Uh, and the 211 call system in Central Maryland receives more than 100,000 calls for help every year. The demand for 211 has more than tripled during the COVID crisis. But what's interesting to me about 211 is that it's a sensitive barometer of the need that's in our area. Um, and so when, uh, when there's cuts to food stamps, we see increases in calls for food assistance. When there's a health crisis, we see increases in calls for healthcare. Um, in terms of 211 data, when the crisis first happened, the number one call was for food. That makes sense. People uh, lose their hours at their work, and so they need to figure out where they're going to get food. But then, uh, increasingly, medical care became the greatest call to 211 as folks were trying to find, find, find medical resources and assistance dealing with the COVID crisis or wondering where to get tested. Now, housing has surpassed both medical and food as the number one need for 211 calls. So, and this is the first time housing has emerged as the number one need since the foreclosure crisis as part of the Great Recession. So our most sensitive barometer for, for measuring social need, which is 211, is flashing red that housing is now the most demanded service. And this is the front line in the financial crisis and the fallout. But let me introduce an idea or a theme of today's discussion by way of a metaphor. They say that COVID affects folks who have pre-existing conditions. Well, I wanna introduce the theory that America had a pre-existing condition prior to COVID coming on the scene. COVID came in on top of an already existing housing crisis that was underway well before the disease came along. I wanted to show this slide. I think this is, a, this is one of the measures that a lot of experts point to for, uh, for housing crises. There was what we call an affordable housing gap in Maryland before COVID happened. For every 10 extremely low income renters that needed affordable housing opportunities, there were only three available. And this is like a game of musical chairs. If you can't find an apartment that you can afford, uh, then you're gonna have to make tough choices. And these are the tough choices that Alice families face every day. Families who have to pay more than 30% of your income on housing, and that's the magic number. If you talk to researchers in the housing space, 30% of your income is about what you can afford in terms of your survival budget before you have to start making cuts elsewhere. So and this is sort of a, a number that experts all across in every theater have arrived at. You'll hear this 30% number thrown around a lot. If you pay more than 30% of your income on rent, then you are what's called rent burden. And more than 50% of your income on rent, you're extremely rent burdened. And so when there's a financial crisis, it's those renters that are rent burdened or extremely rent burdened that are the most likely to be at risk of eviction and homelessness. But for those Alice families that are having to pay more than 30% of their income on rent, they're stuck in a situation where they have to make tough choices between quality, where are you gonna make cuts? Between quality childcare or quality healthcare, they have to work multiple jobs and therefore spend less time with their family. They make sacrifices in terms of nutrition or healthcare, you put off dental care. In situations like that, chronic stress increases, you have chronic fatigue, you have a diminished quality of life and a lower life expectancy. And this is why in Baltimore, we see some neighborhoods like Roland Park with a life expectancy of 84 years and poorer neighborhoods like the Clifton area where the life expectancy is 67 years of age. That's nearly a 20 year difference in life expectancy just a few miles down the road in the same city. In addition, there was already a serious racial disparity in the pre-existing housing crisis. This wasn't, this wasn't a race blind crisis. And I, I put this slide up because I'm always shocked by this number. And when I present this at panels or to classes, everyone gasps and says, that can't be right. Um, I urge you to Google this. The average net worth of white households is 10 times that of black households. 10 times that of black households. The key driver of this is um, home ownership. But um, you know, one topic to introduce here is that I like to say there's three types of money. There's income, savings, and credit. And so when your income dries up or you lose your job, what do you do? You spend down on your savings. That's how you make ends meet. Or you accumulate debt. You put things on credit cards. Uh, the data showed a 31% increase in people paying their, credit card, pay, paying their rent on credit cards in April, and then a further 20% increase in May. So you either draw down your savings or you uh, put things on credit. But either way, you draw down on your net worth. And so what happens when, for African-American households, which by and large have less net worth, that is savings, when they lose their jobs, they're much more likely to be pushed to the brink of eviction and or homelessness. 
So it wasn't a level playing field when COVID came along in the first place. So it's safe to say communities of color are being impacted more severely. This is a slide that, I, that puts the Alice conversation into the context of, uh, of, racial, of racial disparities. So you can see that African Americans are already uh, more likely to be among the Alice population and also more likely to die due to COVID. There were already serious financial disparities when COVID came along and COVID exploited those and made it worse. Like I said, America had a pre-existing condition. And I think that we need to have, uh, that we need to have responses that are attuned to the pre-existing disparities in order to devise the best solution. A metaphor that I came up with is gardening. Uh, without taking into account the racial disparities that already existed in crafting your solution to the housing crisis, it would be like trying to garden without knowing the soil conditions or the climate uh, or the average rainfall or what season you're, you're gardening in. You have to have a tailored response in order to get the best results. And a great example that I'm, I'm uh, looking at right now that all of our United Ways are looking at is United Way of Dallas. They are using a tool that was designed by the Urban Institute that shows census tracts where there's high concentrations of racialized poverty, high housing instability, and they are impacted severely by COVID. And they've identified those census tracts and then worked with the housing association in that area to get a list of all of the class C apartments and then connected with those landlords to identify tenants that are already underwater. And they've worked to get targeted eviction prevention strategies to those households that are at the most risk of an eviction actually leading to homelessness. So this is a more efficient use of resources, and it's a program that's designed with racial economic equity in mind. I think that's exactly the sort of forward thinking we need to be looking to in crafting our solutions here in Maryland. And um, this, is, this is an example that I think we need to address this crisis. And this is a big crisis, by the way. Let me remind you, the Aspen Institute projects that 30 to 40 million people will face eviction by the end of the year. For comparison, about 10 million people lost their homes during the Great Recession over that eight year period. So that's 10 million in eight years, and we're talking about 30 to 40 million in eight months. So this is a very alarming statistic. I wanted to land that moment, <laughs> that I wanted to land that for a moment because that's the housing crisis that we're talking about. All of the economic disruption that's taken place is now culminating in a point where people can't pay their rent and it's time to pay the piper and, it's, and, and this is the eviction crisis or the housing crisis that we're talking about. Now, please keep in mind that this is a worst case scenario. It's a projection and it doesn't assume interventions to the crisis, but we do have some actual numbers to show, which is that uh, 250,000 Marylanders are currently behind on their rent. And these are folks that could be evicted if we don't get our solution right and, and we don't coordinate our responses at the state level. For a comparison, I put up here, uh, 6,561 people are uh, currently homeless in Maryland compared to 250,000 that are facing homelessness as a result of COVID. So that's the housing crisis. That's what's at stake. That's what we're here to talk about today. We have a great panel that we've lined up for you and I wanna introduce our panelists. Our first panel panelist is Amy Collier, who is the Director of Community Services Division at Catholic Charities of Baltimore. Hello, Amy, what's something that you're exciting that you're working on right now in the housing space? Thank you, Scott. Um, I'm representing Catholic Charities, and I'm really excited to be a part of this important discussion on this topic. Thank you for the opportunity. Uh, one critical issue related to housing inequity is the acquisition of education and job skills to increase incomes. Despite their desire, students from low-income households often face barriers such as transportation, childcare, juggling employment and work um, that prevent the attainment of their goals to achieve a degree or certificate. So one new and exciting project that we're working on at Catholic Charities is a project called Elevate. And Elevate is a program that we're operating in partnership with the Community College of Baltimore mm -hmm. County to provide Pell Grant eligible students with comprehensive case management services, limited financial assistance, um, to support the attainment of their degrees or certificate, this will open doors for new higher earning career pathways which support housing stability. Thank you. That's awesome. Thanks, Amy, and welcome. Our next panelist is Stuart Campbell, who is the Director of the Office of Community Services Program at the Maryland Department of Housing and Community Development. Hi, Stuart. Hey, Scott. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. And um, 
You know, your question is actually a, a tough one for me because uh, believe it or not, I think there are a number of exciting things that are happening at the Department of Housing and Community Development. Um, even within my neck of the woods, uh, we're working on strategies to increase permanent supportive housing uh, and improve racial equity and service provision. But I think the one that I wanna raise is the fact that um, we are merging and becoming the lead for a balance of state continuum of care. COCs are federally recognized entities that receive and allocate federal homelessness funds. And in Maryland, we receive about $50 million a year. About uh, two years ago, we began having discussions at the urging of HUD with a number of, of the smaller COCs. And uh, as of this year, five of the state's 16 COCs have merged into a single balance of state. So that's Garrett County, Allegheny County, Washington County, Cecil, and then the three counties of Southern Maryland. HUD has been encouraging smaller COCs to merge for a while. Uh, and we're hoping and we believe that this should make uh, these areas much more competitive nationally, uh, which we believe will bring more federal money into Maryland. That's awesome. Great. Thanks, Stuart. Uh, our next panelist is Matt Hill, who is an attorney with the Public Justice Center. Welcome, Matt. What's something exciting you're working on? Thanks, Scott. Um, so again, yeah, Matt Hill, Public Justice Center here in Baltimore. Um, I think the exciting, I don't know if exciting is the right word, but the trying to interpret this uh, CDC eviction order and how it's going to apply to our clients, um, how it can help, how it's not going to help, and trying to get the word out um, about it so the tenants can take advantage of that is uh, something really important. And then we've also been working quite a bit on um, legislation that will provide for a right to counsel in eviction cases, uh, hopefully in the city and maybe even in the state. And so we're very excited about that. We think it's a cost-effective solution that's been uh, implemented in a number of jurisdictions and we think it can make a real difference uh, in Baltimore and Maryland. That's awesome, thanks Matt. Next we have Keenan Jones, who is the Homeless Service Administrator for Baltimore County Department of Planning. Hi Keenan, what's something exciting you're working on? Hello Scott and to everyone that's attending today. Um, something that we're looking forward to and very exciting in Baltimore County is that we're about to release our phase two of our eviction prevention program, which we have identified seven organizations, six are nonprofit and one is a county um, um, agency, which will be um, doing rapid rehousing and totaling about $2 million. Um, so that's something very exciting that we're about to launch within the next couple of weeks. So we're looking forward to that and being very successful and making sure we house people um, instead of them becoming homeless. That's great, thanks Keenan. And our final panelist is Jeff Garrett, who is a homeless advocate and who I have the pleasure of sitting on the Baltimore Continuum of Care Board with. Welcome Jeff, what's an exciting project you're involved with? Thanks, so um, I've been working over the last few months on um, a permanent rapid rehousing program for the city of Baltimore, um, which is something that they've never really had. Um, and so we're looking to be able to um, house 150 of our most um, uh, needful um, people, uh, single individuals, and then also about 40 families uh, with this program. And as you saw from the numbers, uh, that's just a small drop in the bucket, unfortunately. Um, but, you know, any bit helps. And it's all a matter of getting the flow starting to go again. So I'm um, excited about that. You should be seeing something from an RFP coming out within the next few weeks uh, from the city and we'll go from there. That's great. Thanks, Jeff. Uh, so our uh, first tailored question is to you, Amy. Even before COVID happened, uh, Alice families in Central Maryland were struggling to get by and a big reason was the cost of rent. 49% of Marylanders pay more than that magic 30% threshold that I was talking about. They pay more than 30% of their income on rent. 49% of people, uh, I, why, why, is, why is it that so many people are unable to uh, afford rent? Why are so many people facing eviction? And what does this look like for families in this situation? Thank you, Scott. Um, as noted, the inequities of the housing crisis is, are longstanding. Um, and have been exacerbated by COVID. 
Uh, there are many confounding barriers to why Alice families and individuals are unable to afford rent. Um, the lack of available affordable housing was certainly something that pre-existed before COVID and is, continues to be a crisis. Um, historical discriminate, discriminatory housing practices, um, such as redlining, um, restrictive covenants, and predatory financial practices at the state, federal, and local levels have impacted families' ability to afford rent. And limited housing options, especially for minority and low-income households, many of whom are working minimum wage jobs, are working in essential services right now, and are struggling to meet basic needs. There is a, um, Baltimore is one of the most stark examples of racial segregation um, that it focuses on some of those practices just noted and it's detailed in a book um, entitled Not in My Neighborhood where it really outlines the history within Baltimore, our community of um, racial segregation and how that has impacted the housing crisis for many years dating back to the 1960s. Alice families have income that is insufficient to meet their basic needs. And those basic needs include childcare, which has been an expense that has been rising. And with COVID, childcare expenses will continue to rise as many childcare centers are unfortunately going out of business. So the availability of childcare will decrease and the cost of that childcare that providers are gonna to have to charge in order to stay open will increase. Childcare, healthcare, um, the actual cost of housing in our area, the cost of food, which we have also seen exacerbated by COVID-19 with some of the food shortages that we saw at different points during this crisis. Um, the lack of transportation, the cost of transportation and childcare are all challenges that Alice families face, which make um, rent very difficult for them to pay along with those other basic needs. As noted, 49% of Marylanders are paying greater than 30% of their income for housing alone. And as we see the other basic necessities, the cost of other basic necessities increasing, that percentage of income that is necessary just for housing leaves very little for families to be able to manage just basic necessities. And families are often forced to make difficult decisions between health care and food, um, between child care and being able to bring income into the household if they do have care for their children. There is a drastic difference between the income of families according to the federal poverty level standards and the amount of income that is needed to cover these basic needs. Um, this really disproportionately affects families where that difference is far greater than that um, even for individuals. For example, for a family where the federal poverty level income is $25,000, the actual income that's needed for just basic living expenses is $87,000. So this really puts our Alice families at a disadvantage um, for just meeting basic needs. And we know that um, there are needs that are far beyond the basic needs that are important for families to sustain themselves. During this time, we've also seen much more need for behavioral health services. Many families um, don't have access to that, or if they do, there are co-pays associated with that. Families that have been impacted by COVID, which has disproportionately impacted communities of color, Many have lingering effects, which increases their healthcare expenses, um, which were already very difficult to manage. So the high unemployment rate, um, which has resulted from COVID, 
has impacted Alice families, which were already financially unstable. Um, our Alice families have not been able to save over time. So a crisis such as COVID, which has caused many individuals to lose their employment, creates destabilization in the household immediately. Our families also are challenged with their income earnings. Um, and again, that's due to their education, job skills, lack of opportunities in certain um, sectors for them to earn higher incomes. These are families that are our essential workers. However, their incomes are below what is needed for them to um, maintain their households. So at this point, our vulnerable families who were vulnerable before COVID-19 are more likely to face eviction. They're more likely to have lost their income. Um, many of our families are often shared housing before the COVID-19 pandemic um, due to the income that they had and their inability to sustain housing independently, there were shared housing. So we're now facing families that may have multiple individuals in the household that have lost their employment. So they're more likely to face eviction. Um, we spoke about the increase in use of credit so their credit is um, credit debt is increasing along with fees, um, as well as toxic stress um, that is associated with the pandemic itself. Some of the um, health lingering healthcare issues and just the concern about how to meet basic needs. Thanks, Amy. Uh, let's bring in Stuart. Stuart, what do you think about uh, Amy's suggestion that uh, incomes are not keeping up with rising costs of living? Well, I, I think that's exactly right. Uh, the simple answer to why um, so many people are struggling is because the price of housing has been increasing and wages simply haven't been keeping up. Uh, I don't disagree with a thing that Amy said. I mean, she uh, points out a number of factors that uh, flow into this. Um, and I think there may be others. Um, but what this looks like is that housing stability, uh, uh, housing is unstable for far too many households. Essentially, folks are living paycheck to paycheck. When a household loses their income, their housing becomes extremely precarious. Um, what we do know is that in normal times, the overwhelming majority of people in this situation actually manage to remain housed but a small uh, and significant portion do fall into homelessness. Um, so the challenge is to move those ind individuals back into housing as quickly as possible. So the strategy that our department um, employs is that um, we do a couple of things. Uh, we try and increase the amount of affordable housing that is uh, available across the state. Uh, on an annual basis, we increase uh, affordable housing by about three or 4,000 units a year. And while that doesn't sound like a lot, um, it's more than um, we have historically. So um, I think uh, our secretary and our department has done a really um, good job of, of working within the resources that we receive from the federal government through the Low Income Housing Tax Credit Program to uh, expand as affordable housing as, as much as possible. The other strategy is that when individuals do fall into uh, homelessness, we support programs like rapid rehousing. Jeff mentioned it earlier, and I think it's, it's a really critical and important strategy that quickly moves households out of homelessness and back into permanent housing. Uh, and so those are the two things that, that um, at least we are focusing on to try and address this issue. Great, thanks so much, Stuart. Uh, Jeff, over to you. Uh, this panel is called The Realities of Inequity, and um, it's for sure the case that households of diverse demographic compositions and family structures face, have a different experience in the housing market. Uh, families may face barriers based off of their credit score, criminal background, criminal, rental history, income levels, um, and many government programs that are designed to respond to COVID have restrictions that make entire categories of folks ineligible for that assistance. How can we reduce those barriers? How can we level the playing field and improve opportunities for access to housing? Jeff, that's over to you.
there. Am I on now? Yes. Hi, Jeff. Okay. Sorry. Um, so yeah, we've all had these barriers and, and some of them we've known about and we should have fixed a long time ago. Um, we should allow any source of income to be used for rent. So, you know, if somebody comes in with a Section 8 voucher, they should be able to use that voucher anywhere as a source of income for rent. Um, and the fact that we don't allow that to happen in Maryland is, is shameful. Um, so that's one of the quickest and easiest. But we also have to go all the way back to, you know, the barriers that we've had with, within racial equities and equities within the city. And we have to address those issues as well. Um, and then one of the biggest issues is the word affordable housing to begin with, because what's affordable for one is not affordable for everyone. Um, we talk about Baltimore being um, the butterfly and, you know, up in the middle section, you know, the average home household makes over 80,000, person makes over $80,000 a year. But to the west side of the city, you know, the income is $23,000 a year. And on the east side of the city, it's $20,000 a year. So what's affordable there is not the same as what's affordable in Roland Park and in Charles Village. And thus, you know, we use these um, metrics to determine what rent should be and not what the reality of the circumstances where this building is located. You can't tell me that somebody living in Sandtown, Winchester, who's paying the exact same amount of money per rent for a one bedroom unit living in Charles Village. And the rent is not that difference between the two. And there's something seriously wrong with that when you look at all the other amenities going on around that area. Um, and so there's serious problems with that. So when we're using metrics is like, you know, the, the AMIs from an area, I mean, we, we count Howard County, um, Baltimore County, Anne Arundel County, and all that gets included in our metrics for what an AMI is to determine what the rent market should be in our area. And AMI stands it's not for fair. Area immediate income. Uh, yes. Area immediate income. yes. And so it, it's just, it, it, it already um, slants the scale against those people who work and struggle to work at a minimum wage job. And let's, and let's just admit the fact now, even the federal government admit, you can't afford to live on a minimum wage job. That's why even people that weren't living on minimum wage jobs got a $600 extra boost during this COVID-19 thing, because they knew that the unemployment that goes out that most people take for granted, you know, wasn't going to cover the rent. So, I mean, this is what people that have been working on minimum wage jobs dealt with all along, and they never had somebody come by and offer them an extra $600 a month to make ends meet. But I mean, I've been living my whole life this way. Um, and I know there's a lot of other families that have as well. And so I think what, you know, the best thing that happened now this COVID-19 is it, it's drew attention that everybody now can relate to this circumstance now because we're all facing it together. And so as a whole, we need to address it together. And I think that's going to change the, the circumstances in the playing field when it comes to addressing this issue. That's great. Thanks so much, Jeff. Uh, Keenan, what do you think? Yeah, I do agree with a lot of the information that Jeff had just spoke about. Um, and, you know, I do know that we can best reduce these barriers by working closely with the faith-based um, community. That's something that we're doing in Baltimore County and the nonprofit providers, both large and small, providing assistance to data and working to identify specific gaps to target their funding priorities and their program criteria. The Health and Human Services has access to limited emergency funds, which can be tapped to address specific gaps. And we, along with Baltimore City, has engaged in conversation with private philanthropy um, regarding that. How do we level the playing field? By leaning on other entities to provide assistance in their area of expertise. For example, in Baltimore County, once again, we have embarked the importance of non-financial aid um, in these situations. Therefore, the county has engaged with the Fair Housing Action Center to provide tenant counseling, cash for benefit screening, financial navigation, and Maryland legal aid, and other legal 
services. Uh, please note that many people focus on the expense that is not most pressing at a given time when they may be eligible for other resources, which can reduce the amount of money that they have spent on expenses, such as, and Amy talked about this, Jeff talked about this, and Stuart even talked about the expenses such as food, utilities, health care, child care, and stretch their budgets. Um, another thing that we've done in Baltimore County right now to reduce the barriers is that we've hired an employment council who is focused on helping our most vulnerable residents get back to work and or connect with appropriate training and significant um, certificate programs. We have improved our opportunities um, for access by implementing phase one of our eviction prevention program, which recognized early on that we had some holes, <laughs> we can admit that we had some holes in access to our application, namely that our application was only available online and it was only available in English. To fill that gap, we engaged nonprofit partners who experienced uh, with housing assistance programs. They were able to work with clients facing technological or language barriers over the phone and complete their applications on their behalf. One lesson here is that the challenge of COVID-19 have required us to speed up forms of assistance at a rapid pace. We often lack the time to really think through how uh, we include equity at every step along the way. No entity, government or nonprofit, is immune from the ex um, excessive pressure of COVID-19. And within phase one of our eviction prevention program, we saw that many applicants and that was something that Jeff was talking about a few minutes ago, were above the program income threshold due to irregular income, such as the stimulus checks and extra unemployment payments, creating an inflated, um, inflated picture of their income that likely could not be sustained. So one could reasonably argue that many who fall into this category are deserving of rental assistance given the brutality of their financial situation. The That's lesson right. here, learned here, is that these types of programs should make eligibility broad and uh, remove any limitation as possible by funding sources. Great. Um, so those are some things that we really saw right off the bat. And then we have to make the thing a little bit more simplistic. To, once again, if anybody is getting ready to um, launch a rental assistance program in their jurisdiction, they need to really look at how they can make the application short and easy to understand for you know, e every you know. high. Great, great. We need to move on to the next question. Okay. I really appreciate that, that response. Stuart? Uh, over to you. Uh, many different levels of government have sought to halt, halt evictions by executive decree in the form of eviction moratoriums. Some have argued that this approach discourages people from paying their rent, and other people think that this is holding back a tsunami of evictions. Are eviction moratoriums the right thing to be doing right now? Sure. Uh, before I address evictions, I do want to mention um, that the HOME Act passed in uh, the General Assembly earlier this year, and it was um, enacted into law. So effective October 1, uh, landlords can't discriminate based on uh, lawful source of income. So uh, at least there's some change happening, which um, I'm happy to report. So um, to uh, moratoriums. So uh, first off, we strongly encourage households to pay their rent if they are able to, uh, or to negotiate their land with their landlords during this period. Uh, we don't encourage folks to hold off if they have the ability to, to pay their, their rent. So I think moratoriums are an imperfect tool in an imperfect world. Uh, the last thing we want to see is households, through no fault of their own, losing their homes because they can't pay their rent. So in that sense, these moratoriums are a good thing. However, landlords, especially mom and pop landlords, are struggling too. They have their own bills to pay. Uh, the governor recognizes this, and that's why he set aside $30 million in rental assistance funds in July. And if I could just quickly uh, go over those, 
10 million of those funds are through the assisted housing relief program and that's designed to assist tenants in about 800 properties that the department has funded over the years and that's about 40,000 units. The program covers delinquent rent from April through August and then soon September. And as of Octo uh, excuse me, August 30th, we have assisted over 3,000 households. The remaining 20 million is a broader program that local jurisdictions can apply for to supplement their own funds. This program is funded out of the approximately 26 million in CDBG funds that the state received through the CARES Act. Uh, and we also estimate that so far, local jurisdictions have about 30 million in additional dollars that they've been able to put up uh, through a variety of sources. So what this moratorium does is it's keeping families housed and with a roof over their heads. Um, keep in mind, we're in the middle of things right now. We don't know how things will ultimately play out. And moratoriums are a tool to ensure that the households impacted by COVID-19 stay safe within their own homes as we closely keep an eye on things. Um, this issue though, isn't limited to Maryland. And while I can't speak for him, I know that the governor has called on increasing funding to states uh, and we're hopeful that Congress will pass another relief package. So in short, is the moratorium a good thing? Well, we believe at least for the moment, it's working as intended and keeping uh, the same tsunami that people are referring to of people going out on the streets uh, and at least giving us some time to try and figure out some solutions. Thanks, Stuart. Matt, what do you think about that? And uh, you have about one minute to, to elaborate. Only one minute? Uh, um, well, I'm going to sort of, I, I, I respectfully disagree with Mr. Campbell. I think just to, to extend a very important thing that everyone should know, there is no eviction moratorium in Maryland right now, right? Uh, the eviction moratorium was lifted by the Court of Appeals on July 25th. Um, in Baltimore City alone, with about only two weeks of evictions, uh, there were 50 families who were evicted in the city alone just in those couple weeks of August. What we do have in place is the governor's executive order and now an order from the Center for Disease Control and Prevention that provide very limited defenses to tenants who meet very specific criteria and are able to then assert those criteria in, in court, uh, preferably with the help of an attorney because they're not, they're not easy um, to prevent an eviction. Um, there are also a number of loopholes, so they don't apply to all different types of evictions. There are a number of loopholes and we're seeing landlords aggressively exploiting those loopholes right now. Um, so I think moratoriums are a great thing. I wish we had one, um, but we don't. And unfortunately, the way these things are structured, they're, they're becoming like a nonprofit lawyer employment act uh, because of how difficult it is for uh, very low income tenants, particularly the most vulnerable tenants, to take advantage of them. Um, now, I think that, that that does speak to the need for a right to counsel in eviction cases. I told you in the beginning that we've been working a lot on that. I think regardless of these, these orders and these issues, um, I think that a right to counsel has been proven. We, we had a study from um, Stout showing that if you spent $5.7 million in the city on a right to counsel, uh, you'd save the city and the state $35.6 million. And that's in the healthcare costs, the shelter costs, the school costs, that folks who are homeless because of an eviction uh, inevitably uh, uh, bring to the city and the state. Um, I think if we had a moratorium, it would be a great thing, but it's not a systemic solution. As I think um, you know, uh, Mr. Campbell was pointing out, we need real rent relief. Um, we have 274,000 households in Maryland by one estimate that are behind on the rent um, and facing some sort of eviction. Um, and the $30 million is, is a good start, but that's only about $109 per household. And so what we're seeing is a real systemic gap in terms of what people owe and what they, they need to pay in order, to, excuse me, what they have in income and what they owe in order to avoid eviction. And I think that, you know, there are solutions out there, right? The state could allocate more of its federal funds um, from the CARES Act to this purpose. There have been federal solutions proposed in the HEROES Act that passed the House. Um, and so that we know how to fix this, but the time is, the, the clock is ticking and, um, you know, evictions are happening right now. Thanks, Matt. Uh, Keenan, back to you. The slogan, Rebuild Better, Rebuild Better, 
is gaining popularity. Many take this to mean we shouldn't re return to the COVID status quo, the pre-COVID status quo where folks were barely able to make ends meet. But instead, given the enormous economic shock that's taking place, this is an opportunity for us to think of some entirely new solutions. Is this naive optimism or do we really have a chance to, to uh, create something new here? And uh, we only have about two minutes left for this response. We're running out of time. All right, I can give it to you real quick. Rebuild Better is um, being very optimistic. As I mentioned before, in Baltimore County, we pa partnered with the Fair Housing um, Action Center to provide tenant counseling, benefit screening, financial navigation, which should be made permanent if outcomes, support, and funding is available. Um, we are stressing in Baltimore County to be more proactive and not reactive assistance and services designed to promote self-empowerment need to be prioritized. Also, a, um, a major opportunity for changes for housing um, in intervention, such as rapid rehousing, which should be more fl um, flexible and expanded much longer. Um, so those are things that we're working on, as well as our um, county exec has a work team that we're stressing together to do what we need to do to make sure we don't do business as usual. But once again, we have a different lens because of COVID-19 moving forward. So I think I'll shut up right there. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks, Keenan. Jeff, what do you think? Are we able to rebuild better? So, you know, I, the question's interesting to me because it's not a matter of can we, it, uh, it's will we. Um, and I think this election is going to say a lot of that because, you know, it, it really is almost facing a do we go back to the, who we were post-COVID-19 uh, uh, um, or, you know, or do we move forward with a new kind of country um, and a new society? And I'm hoping the latter instead of, um, you know, going back to the same old way as before. Uh, that would be great, um, and I'm not looking forward to that. So hopefully we have a great election this year. Uh, the country moves forward. I believe we can. Um, I know that everything that we're doing from the homeless standpoint is trying to recreate things from not from where things were from the past, but um, looking at building things without shelters in place um, and, and all the other elements that were just so horrible within the homeless service community um, we're looking to re reinvent all of that um, because we feel we have a fresh slate to work with. Great. Thanks so much, Jeff. Uh, and now our final question uh, over to you, Matt. You may have heard that there's an election coming up. Uh, the polls show the presidential race is tightening and there are close races all over the country. No doubt housing will be a frequently discussed topic. What are some things to look for in these debates? What aspects of a candidate's position on the housing debate should we be looking at when we decide who to vote for? Sure. I mean, I think that the, the most pressing issue is reinstating a federal eviction moratorium. Um, we had a limited federal eviction moratorium. We need a full federal eviction moratorium. Um, again, rent relief. The House passed the HEROES Act. Um, who is going to actually address the systemic lack of, um, of rent payments that folks have right now and the, the amount of money they need to pay in order to remain stably housed. Um, other things that are part of the, the, the national conversation are right to counsel in eviction cases nationwide is definitely something that we've seen a lot of. Um, expanding the housing choice voucher program. This is, um, you know, if you follow Matthew Desmond um, and his great work on evictions, he says, look, if you just provide a folks who need it a voucher, um, you're going to solve a tremendous amount of the housing instability out there right now. So those are, and then, you know, there are also attacks on, on fair housing around the affirmatively furthering fair housing rule, the Community Reinvestment Act, who, who is going to support um, fair housing and making sure we expand and uh, those, those critical uh, tools. And so I think that those are, those are important issues to watch for. And I hope that the candidates address those, although I, frankly, I'm not going to hold my breath. Great. Thanks, Matt. Uh, so we've just heard from really great information from the experts here. Uh, Amy, do you have a response to Matt on the upcoming election? I, I agree with what Matt has shared, some very comprehensive solutions to the um, housing crisis here. I would also add that um, a focus on homelessness is important. 
to listen to the, how the candidates are going to support individuals that were homeless prior to COVID, um, who will certainly be facing uh, mounting challenges as the housing crisis has, imp has impacted many individuals that had not previously um, experienced um, homelessness. So that, that's one area that I think is critical. I think it's also critical to look at um, some relief for interest and penalties that are associated with the non-payment of rent um, in addition to um, relieving the rent itself and also providing support for, for the landlords who are also facing a crisis and um, stand to um, eliminate some buildings that are in use now for various purposes if they aren't able to sustain the um, tenants that they have. Great, thanks Amy. So that's all of our panelists' questions for right now. This was some really great information from the experts in the field. Uh, for our part, I wanna take just a minute to tell you all about some of the exciting things that United Way of Central Maryland is doing to respond to the housing crisis. Um, first of all, United Way has our Family Stability Program. This is essentially an eviction prevention program that we fund community partners to do the work in their local areas. This program is uh, $1.6 million annual investment, uh, making us, United Way of Central Maryland, one of the largest funders of eviction prevention in the state. Uh, the program serves 500 families a year. That's about $3,200 per family. Uh, and we recently completed an, a study that showed that this gets a four to one return on investment, meaning for every $1 that our United Way spends on preventing family homelessness, we prevent $4 from having, be, having to be spent on social services like food stamps, shelter beds, crisis response. And our family stability program has a 98% success rate. I like to say that we are among the best in the business at keeping families housed. 98% of families stay housed while in our program and 99% of students in those families stay in their schools of origin. We think that case management is the secret sauce of our program. Not all families have the same need. And so when the state of Maryland is considering how to respond to this eviction crisis, some families writing a check and stopping the eviction is gonna do the trick. But for some families, you need to address the self-sufficiency component or they're gonna keep coming back to the well again and again needing eviction prevention assistance. So what our program does is it links case management to eviction prevention and the case managers work with the families on workforce access, connecting people to government benefits like unemployment assistance or food stamps. They work with them on budgeting and financial counseling. Uh, and that's where we get, that's how we're able to achieve these magnificent outcomes of 98% success rate. And so one of the things we're doing is working to expand this program during the crisis and find other sources of funding. Another thing that United Way of Central Maryland is doing is raising money. That's one of the things that we're good at. We've raised $2.5 million so far in our COVID community fund. And this money is being given out to community partners like food banks, uh, medical assistance programs, helping folks with medical transport, legal assistance, digital equity, digital access for students to get access to the internet, access to computers. These funds are supporting dozens of partners all across the region. And an example of a program that I'm involved in that uh, has been funded from the United Way Community Fund is our 211 Emergency Assistance Program. So this program activates during times of national emergency, like when the government shut down two years ago. We took $25,000 of funds from the COVID Community Fund uh, that United Way has raised, and we put this into the 211 Emergency Assistance Program. And we used that $25,000 as seed money to leverage other partners and other government programs. And we were able to steer $200,000 of government assistance into this program that 211 can use in limited circumstances for folks who need eviction prevention assistance, but have fallen through the cracks of all of the other responses that are going on right now. So this allows us to plug gaps in the system. But what's interesting to me is that we took $25,000 and turned it into $200,000 by leveraging our vast network of connections, volunteers, and community partners. And that's eight times the original amount of money that was invested in the program. And that's what I call the United Way multiplier effect. By strategically leveraging resources, we're able to move, we're able to move money around and pair it with pair it and blend it and braid it with other funding sources to get an even bigger effect. And that's why I like to trust United Way with my donation dollars because we get the most bang for the buck uh, and are able to multiply them so they have even more impact in the community. The other thing that I'm talking about a lot, I find myself talking about a lot, is that there's a lot of government money becoming available right now. 
And so where does it make sense for philanthropy, which is just a drop in the bucket, to put our money? Well, philanthropy dollars are unique because they're super flexible. Government dollars are big, but they have a lot of red tape that comes with them, a lot of bureaucracy. Philanthropy dollars are smaller, but they're super flexible, they're super nimble, and they can be used to fill gaps in the system. So for example, in Carroll County, they have a massive response to eviction prevention, but they didn't have any money in their entire continuum to cover first month's rent. So United Way created a unique partnership where we're gonna be paying for folks who end up being evicted to be able to pay their first month's rent. In Harford County, we're paying, you know, there's the Maryland Energy Assistance Program. That's a, there's a lot of money on that program, but folks with documentation barriers aren't able to apply for those funds. Well, United Way money can help with utility assistance for people who have documentation challenges. Uh, an example I love to give is that we were able to get eyeglasses for someone who needed them for a commercial driver's license. So for me, the best thing about being at United Way is being able to think strategically and to move money where it's needed and when it's needed, and that's what we do. Another solution that I want to give a nod to is the Mid-Atlantic Community Network that our partner Kaiser Permanente is introducing to the area. Um, this is a, a cross-system strategy where partners can refer to each other from different sectors. So a housing provider can refer someone for food aid or a healthcare system can refer someone for mental health services or for housing services. And also providers in the same sector can coordinate their responses using this system. So North Carolina, for example, through their United Way and 211 is using this, is using this same platform to coordinate their entire housing, housing system response. All of the eviction prevention in the state is going through this system. And this platform allows partners from all different sectors to make referrals to one another in one central system. And Kaiser Permanente is just launching this system in the greater Baltimore region in October. So stay tuned for exciting developments in this arena. That comes to the end of our presentation. The panelists, uh, if you could put up the slide with the panelists' uh, contact information. So if there's anything that you heard today from any of the panelists that you'd like to follow up on, any of these experts that you'd like uh, to, to continue the conversation with, or any questions you have, the panelists' email addresses will be on here. That's all the time we have for this afternoon. So thank you to our panelists and to our partners and to all of you for joining us in this important conversation. We'll leave this slide up with the contact information for the panelists. Uh, and thank you so much for tuning in. Hope you have a great day and, you, and, and uh, continue to live united. Thanks everyone. Scott, we, Scott, we will be sending the contact information after we'll this We'll be meeting. sending it out. Okay, great. I stand corrected. So look forward to that email and thanks everyone for joining us this afternoon. Thanks again to our panelists. Thank you all. Thank you. Have a great day. Thank you.